So, and that's what I've learned. I, I have a dear friend who's a horse whisperer who comes with me to Africa. Uh, the friends that I work with in the bush are very tuned in with animals, and they all feel the animals, and the animals feel them back. And I asked Adam, do all animals feel you? And he said, yes. And I said, do all people feel you? And he said, no, only some. Hmm. Oh, I love that story. And that's really, when, when you talk about the word, wordlessness, because mm-hmm. that's what you spoke about yesterday, and everything, the connection with nature, going on those game drives and yeah. just being silent, yes. and the connection that he had with that lion and with other animals, it's that, it's that wordlessness. And we live yeah. in a society where there's very little silence. Yeah. It's, there's so much less noise, and less isn't and less. there? Oh, now it's not just the oh. television and the computer, but the television has little sub-screens, and it's got a ticker tape running across the bottom, and it's got people arguing with each other about nothing, and it's just words, 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 words. And that keeps the brain in a state of anxiety, fight or flight, puts us in a stress Um, uh, nervous system state where we get uh, diseases. I I had chronic pain for 12 years because I was so in that world. And dropping out of the verbal mind calms the body, calms the nervous system, heals us, makes us connect with each other. And yet we don't do it. Mm -hmm. We are so attached to our words to our verbal analytical minds. Mm. You, I mean, if you, you say that you were feeling the anxiety, the, you know, this continual bombardment, the, mm-hmm. the noise. Yeah. So at, at what point did you realize and how did you realize that you needed the time out? You're building yourself up. You're writing books. People are demanding of you all the yeah. time. You're coaching. You're helping others. How, you know, how did you reflect and say, wait? I started struggling with that as mm-hmm. a young teenager when I was... 15 in, in my high school, um, they wanted me to compete in all these different different events all over America in different fields, contests and things. And I remember feeling just pulled apart into a million pieces and bursting into tears one day in the middle of an English class. And my English teacher took me into her office and she said when I was, she, she had four children by the time she was 20 years old and she said we had a field of corn and she said sometimes I would just run into the corn and hide from my children and I would sit there unless I could hear someone was being mortally wounded and she said to me Martha never go without a cornfield run into the corn every time you need to mm, so what I, wonderful words yeah mm, and I remember thinking in my at mind 15, as well. what, what are you talking about mm. but I remembered it and it sank in and every time I forget to run into the cornfield um, I'm reminded by suffering so eventually I get around to it mm. I'm, so, I'm sure so many people can relate to that mm-hmm. um, you know parents and they torn you know careers and their kids those who don't also their careers meeting yeah. other expectations doing yeah. that and and also, uh, and I'm sure this is how a lot of people feel, is the sense of, I'll get there. There mm-hmm. will be time to run into the cornfield, just not now. Yeah. Let me just quickly complete X, Y, and Z, then I'll hit the cornfield. Yeah. And it's this constant feeling of, I'll get there. Mm-hmm. And it's always illusory. You mm-hmm. never reach it. I've coached millionaires who are just trying to get enough money to be safe. Yeah. And I've coached people on the street who are just trying to get enough money to be safe. And they use the same language. They have the same emotions. You have to volunteer voluntarily choose to rest from that and then abundance starts to flow to you and that's when magical things start happening when you are willing to take the leap of faith and let go of that constant hamster wheel you know panic to to pursue more stuff Mm. and just be in the moment because right now you're fine Mm. so experience being fine you are now in the place you hope to achieve when you get enough money Fabulous. We're going to take a break, Martha. If you have any questions for Martha, the lines are open. You can always call in on 0861 24 24 36. You can also SMS us on 34519. Or you can just sit back, relax and enjoy. 101.9 Chi FM. 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 Well, welcome back. Um, thanks for staying with us. Nikki Seberini in your element. Uh, we have Martha Beck in the studio this morning, uh, American sociologist, therapist, life coach, best-selling author. Um, and Martha, you know, we, we were talking about this hectic life. You take time out. Mm-hmm. Do you sit for long periods of time and think about things, think about processes, think about ways to explain these ideas to people who who need to find their way. Does it just come to you? Do you have to search hard? Oh, I'm. Where is it? 
I search, but I wouldn't call it hard. It's for me, it's fascinating, and so I, I, I'm compelled by a joyful sort of impulse to continuously look for this stuff. I'm, I'm really quite obsessed with it, and so are all my friends. So it's play for me. It's fun. Um, I do sit for long periods, but I try not to think at all during those uh-huh. times. It's a, it's a freedom from thought. And but then when I when I come back into thought. The, the internet especially has given me access to so much information. And then another strange thing happened while I was writing this. I didn't put this in the book because no one would have believed it. Once I set my intention to study people who could sort of do things like telepathy and, and you know, the paranormal things that, that magic people are supposed to be able to do, once I set my intention to interview them, they started finding me. They would just show up at my house mm. sometimes or, or call me or email me. And it was just it bizarre. Is, it is bizarre. It is. Yeah, you have no idea. Do you do you ever worry that people will criticize that side of of opening up to the shamans, to the people oh, who they can see it? they criticize it all the time. I mean, you're this academic. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're a Harvard graduate. You you would sit and study and write thesis after thesis. So it's been a, a fantastic evolution for you, and you're obviously experiencing it. And as you as you said when you were pregnant with Adam, that's when you started to feel these extraordinary yeah. things. Yeah. Um. So, but that doesn't put you off at all. Oh, uh, you know. I suppose. A lot of people think I'm completely crazy. Um, I suspect, though she's kind about it, that the editor of this book thinks I'm kind of off off the <laughs> edge. Um, and oh. as I wrote in this book, you know, I used to try to tone things down and make it palatable to, to people who weren't exposed to that stuff. And I, I was trying to soften something in this book. I said, if you don't believe me, if you can't go to this place. And I ended up writing... I respectfully do not care. Mm. I mean, it's just I've seen so much evidence of it. I'm giving it to you in tiny spoonfuls. You have no idea how powerful and magical the world actually is. And I'm just too old to keep, you know, softening the blow. (laughs) Isn't it lovely to be at that stage of your life? Yeah. I respectfully do not care. Isn't that fantastic? Mm -hmm. I love that. But you're going on. I mean, the world witnesses your personal journey. Yes, it is. Do. Is it not? And and some people are lovely like you, and some people are not so lovely. And I, you know, that's just the Again, world. Mm. You cannot be interested in what other people mm. think of you. It's it's the way to a miserable, empty, meaningless life. Even if you do get approval from people, it always feels hollow. If you've left your own path, you don't have yourself. Everybody mm. in the room is praising something, but it's not you. Mm. When yesterday, when I was there at that talk, and this room was filled with these men and women who had come along, um, and and you know talking about the the good choices, and they they wanted to hear everything that you had to say, and I just sat there, and I for a moment I looked around, and I thought how incredibly powerful here, you know, a, a room full of people mm. who want to be better, who want to do better, and you're giving them a sense, an idea of your experiences. You're sharing those. Experiences experiences and that's a very very powerful place to be when people really do follow you and mm. and you change people's lives and you know you sit there and you are modest but but it it, it is what you are doing it's a fantastic journey to be on well thank you so much all i do is tell stories mm. and you know and that's what you do every uh. day and i remember uh when i met dave varty who um r- runs londolozzi and that's where we go do our retreats um I remember him saying, you can't change people. You can only change. I can fix the earth, but I can't fix the people. And I said, oh, we can totally fix the people. And he said, how? By sitting around telling campfire stories? And I said, yes. Mm. That is how we evolve to learn. That is how we absorb wisdom from our elders and from from people who, who understand the mystery. Absolutely. We are going to save the world with campfire stories. And we all do that whenever we share the truth of our experience. Mm. Well, think about this book, Finding Your Way in a Wild New World. Had you released this book 20 years ago? You know, what would the response have been? There's no way I could have gotten it published. Mm. Mm. I only got it published on the strength of previous books because it just is too... I wasn't actually going to publish it in paper. I was going to put it out on the internet because it kills less trees. And my agent asked to read it uh, at a certain stage and smuggled it over to Simon & Schuster, and they made me an offer, and I thought, ah, okay. But no, they... I don't think I, it would have gone with mainstream publishing ever mm. 20 years ago, 10 mm. years ago, 
or even now, <laughs> if it were my first book. So look where we are today yeah. and, and more open to those things. What I found very interesting when I was reading up a little bit more about you was that you used to struggle with your weight. Mm -hmm. I find that impossible. I mean, you are petite, you are absolutely tiny. And how, how is that possible? Well, what I realized is that people I was coaching were losing weight without trying. So they, they said, I'm not, I haven't changed my eating, I'm just losing weight. And uh, so I, I started investigating that. And what I found is that when the body is in a fight or flight state, in other words, tension or anxiety, part of that for an animal in the wild says, put on extra padding, have food, because if there's an emergency, one of the things you want is extra fat. And uh, when you go into a rest and relax state, the body will actually drop weight because there's no need to be concerned about it. Mm -hmm. So I basically came up to the conclusion that fear is the most fattening thing in the world. And when people sit and say, I hate my body, and then they start to starve it and make it exercise fast, think about what an animal would do if you hated it, abused it, starved it, and exercised it. It would it would hate you. It would rebel against you. Your body is that animal. And if you treat it lovingly and keep it in a relaxed state, it reaches its optimal level of fat and just doesn't put on anymore. So you, you have what you call thoughtful exercises. Mm, yeah. You just and it's all about again, just dropping into relaxation. It's so simple. We have two we have two parallel sets of nervous system reactions. One is fight or flight, the other is rest and relax. We're always triggering our fight or flight reflex in society. And nature exists almost continuously in a state of rest and relax. And if we can just learn to rest and relax instead of being in fight or flight, a whole lot of things. I, I got over uh, several illnesses that are considered incurable as well. My body just healed itself when I learned to, to live according to my nature. Well, I was going to say that as well. If you can do that with weight, then when you do have some kind of disease mm -hmm. um, in your body, you should be able to do that as well. But is did you have to do a lot of soul searching during that process as well? Oh, yeah, well? absolutely. Going back, releasing, is that what it's about? Oh, yeah, and 10 steps forward, 9 steps back, and doing the wrong thing and not realizing what's happening. It's like... It's a little bit like trying to learn to run a very complicated machine like a bulldozer without having any instruction at all, just by sort of poking around and waving the knobs and mm -hmm. <laughs> eventually learning what works. Mm -hmm. But doing this while bringing up three children and continuing to write books, making time for yourself and, and doing it all, would, it, has it been difficult? Because again, I was you know just trying to read as many things as possible, getting help from others. You say it's important. Oh, yeah. You know, ask for help sometimes. Yeah. We, we, we like to, I spoke to someone earlier and they said, you've got to be in a receptive state as well mm -hmm. as a giving state. Yeah. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean you know just saying great thanks for the gift but also asking can you help me and I'm, I'm very happy to receive your help yeah and I now have quite a circle of people in my life who help me in all sorts of ways and I it's still hard for me to receive that but uh, they all claim they're getting as much as they're giving and it really is a village it's a circle of love and I believe we're all supposed to live in those circles of love does it does it start with asking it starts or with um, yeah, I think it started for me with asking for help from some, you know, from a higher power or whatever. And then it shows up in the form of human beings as mm -hmm. well as other things. But they, again, just like the, the people I researched for this book, many of them just presented themselves to me and said, here we are, we're here to help. Again. Yeah. So let's talk about the book because mm. you were saying that, you know, you had to churn out a book a year and that's how it yeah. was. But you had a five-year break. Mm -hmm. And during those five years, you did a lot of traveling and you did a lot of investigating. Mm -hmm. um, and you've mentioned mentioned um, certain ideas and concepts that you that you have covered but try and tell us a little bit more about I mean coming to Africa but you talked yesterday about shamans and yeah. these fascinating people you spoke about technology um, as well you know for us technology is having access to you know a phone good you know being able to make a phone call in the middle of nowhere right. whereas technology for these healers is uh, connecting to a much higher power right. tell us a little bit about that journey please Martha. yeah well it started with a, a Sangoma in the bush here who told me that 
uh, she she read the bones for me after I'd had a dream that I was going to see my ancestors, which I, I didn't know you were supposed to see the Sangoma, but they brought one to me. And she said, uh, you need to learn these ancient wisdom traditions and teach your people. So I, I set off to do that. And what I found was that all over the globe, in every time and in completely different cultures, people were using the same steps to access the realm of spirit or mystery or whatever that is. And first they would drop out of the verbal brain into what I call wordlessness. Then they'd have a a felt subjective experience of being connected to everything, which I call oneness. Mm -hmm. Then they'd use their imaginations to sort of feel for what wanted to happen. And then they would hold that intention very um, deeply but lightly and release it. And then the last step was forming where what they had imagined would come into being. And it was so interesting to me that the same four steps occurred all over the world. And um, that when they did those steps, all the mystics of every tradition would describe the same phenomena occurring. And it was a little like someone saying, come look through this telescope. You'll see, you know, nine galaxies that you can't see with the naked eye. And scientists won't look through the telescope of these mystical practices. They stand aside and say, no, it doesn't work. We know it doesn't. I can't see those galaxies. Well, you can see them if you look through the telescope. No, I won't look through the telescope. The telescope is wrong. The Mm -hmm. telescope is bad. I know what I see. So I tried it. You know, I just experimented with what I was being taught. And there were a lot of things that didn't work at all for me. And then some things that did. And that was was quite interesting. Wow. 